And thank you very much as well um, to yourself and to the Institute for uh, hosting us so kindly. Um, so, as mentioned, um, I have a background that goes all the way from pure mathematics to applied mathematics through to engineering and computer science and cloud infrastructure. The number of things that I have forgotten is truly vast. So what I'm hopefully going to show you today is some of the examples of how um, those skills have been useful. And the reality is, in any one of those tasks, I had some familiarity, but was always learning. And I don't have, while I joke, I don't have a particularly vast experience of each of these areas. I have a cumulative experience of a wide range of things. And I want to show how important that is in industry and the opportunity and importance of continual learning. So, um, <clears throat> A note on um, the types of technologies we work with. Just out of curiosity, um, how many people have heard of Python? We'll have a show of hands. You'll get used to me asking for a show of hands. There we go. Great. Thank you. And have any, has anyone heard of Rust? Oh, we've got a few. OK, great. And what about Kubernetes? We've got a few still. OK, well done. Um, so got a few enthusiasts in the room. That's a good sign. And uh, we do quite a bit of work using some of these really cloud technologies coming from um, the industrial infrastructure engineering space and try and help use them to help with mathematical problems. So um, as mentioned, um, my colleagues uh, Lana Murphy and Kanika Miglani are both here. So please do feel free to have a chat to them as well. And they um, cross from Alana is working uh, in a combination of humanities and um, quantitative methods. So for some of you, you might find that's an, an intriguing combination. I'm sure Alana can discuss more about that. And um, Kanika, as a graduate of IIT Tirupati, um, has brought uh, fantastic experience and skills around um, some of the machine learning and data science aspects. So, uh, a brief summary, we work across um, a range of countries. Some of members of our team were a relatively small company, but we still have a presence around the world and projects around the world and in all sectors. So it keeps us quite busy. Now, <clears throat> to start this off, I'm going to say, well, Here's a list of some of the examples of ways that mathematics can turn up in industry. So hopefully by now, some of you should have um, some ideas of where and, you know, elements of industrial mathematics can turn up, elements of statistics can turn up, and where R&D that is happening, um, even in relatively theoretical areas, can have an impact on quite implied industrial areas. So that could be everything from, let's say, linear algebra um, for doing matrix computations. And that could be either in machine learning, it could be in computational physics. Um, so my own PhD was in fluid structure interaction, and that's been even important now. Uh, we are working with time series analysis. Um, we're looking at word vectors in natural language processing. So here's an example. If I have a word uh, like king and I want to understand uh, what a female version of a king is, well, I can say, okay, can I do some maths and subtract man and add woman and get from king to queen? That might be surprising, but actually, if you use the right toolkits, then you can start doing, using vectors even in language questions. And that's an incredibly powerful tool that a lot of our modern um, natural language processing kits and so forth are based on. So <clears throat> I said I would suggest six steps because everyone likes steps. You think I've got some steps. I do one, two, three, four, five. I'm there. Now I have all the information. So those of you who've carefully read my abstract, as I'm sure you all have, will uh, be aware that I've said I will cover six suggestions for things that you should 
consider if you are looking at working with or becoming more involved with or collaborating with industry coming from a mathematical or theoretical background. Okay. So first off, conceptual models. <clears throat> so many of you will be familiar with computational models perhaps where we take a specific uh, problem and we take an algorithm. We may have, uh, let's say in the context of continuum mechanics, we may have a um, 3D or multidimensional space that we want to discretize and apply, let's say, finite element algorithm. However, in industry, mostly these questions are being motivated from some fundamental need. For example, I have built a bridge. I need to understand the stress and strains in the bridge and therefore as an, a civil engineer or structural engineer, I need to um, appreciate what's happening and what the risks are. So <clears throat> perhaps there are multiple computational models that apply in different circumstances. One of the areas that we work in uh, quite extensively is starting from having an understanding of what our client or customer wants conceptually to build out this framework and then look at how we can mix and match and compare computational models for that conceptual model. I'll give a concrete example. In the case where we are working with uh, natural disaster visualization and training, um, we could imagine an urban planner or a uh, public health advisor or a um, engineer wanting to see, caring more about what is happening in an area than necessarily um, the exact model or mechanics of what is, um, of how we calculate it or anticipate it or predict it or analyze it. So <clears throat> we say, okay, how can we create a system where you as a person coming to it can uh, select, okay, I want to see what happens if there is a flood here or an earthquake here. And if I'm, let's say, an urban planner, I shouldn't have to know about the detail of the computational model. Perhaps I have to provide some information. Obviously, there needs to be some sort of data, geospatial data, for example, possibly time series data from sensors, possibly statistical data. So, how do we build a system that is focused on the problem, not on the computational model we want to use to solve it? And a lot of our work is actually with taking mathematical models and working with them in, for example, a <coughs> web platform. Okay, so let's say we pick an, uh, let's say we pick a flood and we can say, okay, perhaps on demand, so our modeler is, computational modeler has built an uh, has set up a system, an algorithm. They have it parameterized and we can run it on demand and we say, okay, let's pick a point and um, apply our algorithm um, around that. So our urban planner might say, okay, I want to see at this point what will happen. I can give some information. We also, in most cases, will want to have the option because we have this conceptual model of what an earthquake in an area is, different computational models, not just one. So we might have a complex land flow model that's uh, credit to the land lab team here um, that uses, um, uses a, a discretized grid um, to calculate land flow across the digital elevation model um, using a quite detailed physics. We might have a much more simplified model that's much faster to run, but less um, physically accurate and is based on an elevation grid, for example, and uh, speed of time that inundation from a flood occurs. And we might have something even simpler, for example, um, building codes that happen to uh, specify areas that are at risk or expected flooding risk. 
So if you imagine, as a mathematician, you might approach this problem with a specific idea of solving how you want to solve it. But coming from the other side, from an industrial perspective, you may find that the people you're working with are less interested in the mathematical model, but need to be able to have this conceptual model. So, what do I mean by a conceptual model? In the case of uh, disaster modeling, this might be saying, okay, what are the different tools that we have uh, or what are the different things or terms that people use in the field? Maybe they talk about the, the type of phenomenon that is occurring. You know, is it an earthquake? Is it a volcano? Maybe they talk about the digital elevation model. All of these things build up within our heads a conceptual model. And if we can share that conceptual model, then we can start to talk about how different computational approaches can be compared. Um, <clears throat> out of curiosity, Okay, well, little exercise. How many people have heard of models? See if you're all awake. Yep, that's, yes, that's right. You should have hopefully heard at least the word occasionally. How many people have heard of a domain model? Not so many. So domain modeling is a discipline um, within computing that um, is much more uh, further from the scientific side and the engineering side it's much closer to trying to model problems systematically and the ways in which that can be done. So you sit down, for example, if you sat down to build a system for a bank and how they manage the transactions, then you would say, okay, your domain, your area of expertise involves transactions, it involves customers, it involves branches, and we can build up a systematic model like a graph of how all these things interact and what are called the business rules of how these things interact. And that doesn't talk about how the problem is solved, how we actually implement a banking system. It talks about the conceptual model of how things relate. And what we, uh, one of the approaches we've taken is to say, can we do that with disaster? So for example, we can separate out what is the data, what area does it occur in, and what types of features can we get, what types of uh, geographical, geospatial information. We can say, uh, what are the abstract models that we might have? What are the phenomena like earthquakes and volcanoes? For each of those, what are the computational models? What are the algorithms that we might want to apply? What are the parameters that those can apply to? And then we build up a framework where we can add new models as we go along, that we can have, collabora Ooh, sorry. have collaborations that go across models, that go across different groups and different teams, all trying to save, solve the same conceptual problem. But don't make the mistake of thinking that a conceptual model is just woolly. It is something that you can take a structured approach to understanding. Another example of this, and this is credit to um, the team at uh, NUMA, this is from some years ago, <clears throat> uh, but a nice example of doing this similar approach in uh, the idea of numerical um, modeling and uh, cancer treatment, where uh, you can, for example, an interventional radiologist um, might uh, want to, who is treating a tumor, perhaps in a liver or a lung, they may have a probe and they can put in the probe and they can heat it, they can freeze it, they can electrocute it. There are all of these techniques. Now, this was a, a project I worked on some years ago, as I say, with NUMA, um, and I know there are people still working on it here. Um, <clears throat> and it's um, from the point of view of the uh, doctor, they don't care what the models are. They want to be able to say, okay, if I put in a microwave probe and I turn on uh, this and it heats this area for this long, what will be destroyed? H how much healthy tissue will be destroyed? How much tumor? Okay. They say then, okay, mm, maybe I'll try it with the freezing. I'll put in the probe and see, okay, now I want to see in my web browser, okay, 
what, how much is going to be frozen, how much tumour is going to die, how much healthy tissue. But they care only about the actual patient and the different tools. Hopefully you noticed there that I mentioned um, several things that would involve completely different physics. So we have to have numerical solutions. If we want to have one web interface where you can do each of these things, there must be a Maxwell's equation solver in there somewhere. There has to be a Joule Thompson solver in there somewhere for the cryoablation effect. There has to be a um, Joule heating solver for uh, the uh, radio frequency heating. And for um, electroporation, that's quite an experimental area that is quite hard to model in general. But there are some models for that, and it works with completely different physics again and requires multiple probes. So now think in your head, how can you build a framework that shares all of those things? Because if I build one of them, that's much less useful to the surgeon than being able to give them a tool where they can compare. So how, how do you do that? You have a conceptual model. And we had this same idea as here, where we split out the uh, ability to define the models, microwave or cooling or heating, to specify the data that we might have, to take each individual patient's data as an individual case and say, hey, I want to take this patient here. I want to take each numerical model here and put them together to create simulations with all the parameters for each of those models and then to have someone come along and add a new one. And we can have one web platform to do that. That was the idea and as I say, Numa and uh, the rest of the uh, GoSmart project team have continued working on that. Another example of why conceptual models are a good starting point when working on industrial or um, applications Having a <clears throat> uh, worked with uh, another group, uh, one of our uh, clients and Tomorrow Cities, they do some fantastic work uh, around uh, looking at how urban planners uh, can <clears throat> um, and communities can understand risk. Again, you have to say, okay, well, what's the risk in an area? That's not just one uh, mathematical model to apply with one set of parameters, with one set of physics, you have to provide a system that you understand it from the point of view of the planner or the community looking at this. How do I visualize um, a flood? And I think this is one uh, brief example I'll show. Um, as I say, <clears throat> um, where, A useful point here. There we go. So, for example, we might want to consider how we visualize things that people can understand what's happening. Um, and again, credit to uh, Tomorrow Cities team for this. Um, but a lot of our work has been around how we can take output, varied types of output, varied types of concept, and put it into a, a combined simulation. So that could involve uh, flooding, um, could involve um, <clears throat> earthquake damage, um, and we need to be able to present it in a way that joins those things visually. So sometimes I think it can be, I, one of the reasons that I went into industry was I liked to see how the models and the mathematics that I was working on actually impacted stakeholders, people like uh, planners, people like communities, people like surgeons. And <clears throat> uh, to do that, you need to be able to join the world of computation and the world of the domain, the domain expert, the domain model. So, okay, I'll take questions on that at the end as well. Let's see. The second example I'm going to give here is Fermi approximation. Who's heard of Fermi approximation or engineering approximations? No? Has any, anyone seen the recent Oppenheimer film at all? It's a few. Um, so in it, uh, there, uh, Enrico Fermi, 
um, who was um, extremely uh, a brilliant physicist um, at the time, um, decided that he was uh, going to uh, calculate an approximation for the um, yield of the first ever uh, test detonation of um, an atomic weapon and uh, the Trinity test. And <clears throat> he said, how can I do this? You know, it, it's never been done before. This test has never been done before. But if you get it wrong, I mean, there's a lot of people who are standing there watching. So you need to get it right, you know. But you don't need to get it very close. You need to get it within an order of magnitude. And in fact, he did successfully calculate within an order of magnitude how big the explosion was going to be. <clears throat> and I'm sure everyone was very relieved. But the technique of Fermi approximation is quite powerful. So what is it? Okay. It's the idea that with very little information, you can make order of magnitude approximations. I'll show an example in a minute. The second question is why is that useful and why is it relevant here? Because if I want to, for example, if I wanted to do a, a computational model that gave me some result, how do I check it? Well, I mean, first of all, I can check the theory. Um, that's, you know, standard. I could check it against another computational model, but that might, you know, say, for example, I have issues with my parameters or my parameter selection. Perhaps that's going to affect more models. <clears throat> Jimmy. One of the techniques that's very useful is to be able to say, can I calculate this extremely roughly in a different way? So I'm going to take an example. So the G20 summit was uh, in um, New Delhi last week. And don't shout out enthusiastically, but does anyone know roughly how many people attended? How many visitors there were? No, okay. Does anyone think they could work it out without looking anything up? No, not really. Okay, so Fermi approximation is the technique that lets you do things like that. So let me say, for example, what do we know about the G20? Okay, how many countries are in the G20? Hey, there we go. That's something we all do know. <laughs> so there's 20 countries, let's say, and there's a few guests and there's, you know, hangers on and contributors and things. Let's Let's round it up to 30 and say that there's probably around, so the G20 probably has, let's say, around 30 groups. If it's more than 30, then the name is definitely wrong. And if it's less than 20, the name is very definitely wrong. So let's say there's about 30 groups, two thirds of them are countries, 10 are NGOs or whatever. And, okay. Now, here's another question. <clears throat> Let's say there, we've got all these, all these entities flying people across the world to attend meetings. Okay, it's going to be a bunch of sessions. Let's say, how big is each session likely to be? Let's say, do we think the average number of people in a session is 30 or 300 or 3,000? So 30, well, that's about, you know, that would mean basically every um, session had only one person from a country. It seems quite small. They tend to send big delegations, right? So, okay, so 30, to me, 30 seems a little small. I don't know. But 3,000? I don't know how many 3,000 seat lecture theaters there are uh, in Delhi, but um, enough for the whole G20. I, especially if this is the average size of the number of people in each session. Seems a bit big. So who reckons 30 is the average? So I'll put here, average, a 
attendees per session. Okay. Who reckons the average attendees per session at the G20 is 30? It's a bit low. What about 3,000? It's a bit high. 300? Eh, could be. So let's, let's start with that. It's a guess, but we were able to make a guess there where previously we couldn't guess the total number of attendees. So, how many parallel sessions do we think there are? One to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000. Well, I would suggest if it's one to 10, it's a long way to travel. If you only have uh, three or four parallel sessions going on for the whole G20, that seems quite small, right? If someone reckons that there's between 100 and 1,000 parallel sessions of 300 people, then I really want to, them to help me organize my next conference. <laughs> but that seems a little large. So, okay, again, how many people reckon there's between one and 10 parallel sessions happening? Small. 10 to 100? Seems more reasonable. 100 to 1,000? Bit big. Let's, let's do a show of hands here because I think everyone's like, hmm, which is it, which is it? So, okay. So keep your hand, everyone put your hand up. There we go. Got there, great, thanks. <laughs> Okay, put your hand down if you reckon there was between one and 10 parallel sessions at the G20. One in 10, that at any time there's fewer than 10 meetings going on. Okay. So who reckons there's between, if you reckon there's between 10 and 100 meetings, bearing in mind these are of 300 people each. So 300 people is not a small number of people. Who reckons between 10 and 100? Okay. 100 to 1,000, we've got a couple of people, okay. Fair enough. I think the consensus is mostly around this. Now, <clears throat> oh yeah? Yes? This is true. Yeah, you, you can definitely improve this estimate. And I mean, for example, this is parallel sessions. So um, the total number would be bigger, of course. Um, it'll be that times the length, basically. But, but you're right. I mean, you could also look at this a different way and say, OK, how many days is this running for? How long, uh, you know, can we work out how many people are around for how many days? Or how many um, people could realistically, for how many hours, be in sessions? Um, absolutely. And that's the beauty of this. You can calculate this multiple ways, but as long as you're right within an order of magnitude, it's okay. But yes, good point. Thank you. So if I multiply these together, so say on average 300 people and let's say 50, take an average, 50 sessions at a time, that gives me 15,000, 15, which is apparently a rough estimate. Um, and seemingly is about the reported number of visitors to the G20. Okay. <clears throat> now, <laughs> these numbers are probably completely wrong. The point is that by, some of them will be overestimated, some are underestimated. I can do this calculation and get similar numbers if I try and approximate. So they said the premium hotels in Delhi are sold out because of the G20. You can do the same calculation with that, work out roughly how many, you know, put some numbers together about how many hotels there are and how many people would stay on average and therefore how many there's likely to be and then how many, what percentage of people in those hotels and you actually get a similar order of magnitude. So, point is if I have a computational model, I can use these types of techniques to validate that. <clears throat> and this is really powerful in, <laughs> Thank you. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Great. Um, has anyone heard of the Drake equation? 
No. Okay. Yes. Well, Alana and Kanika have because they've heard this, uh, heard me talk about the Drake equation before. I get quite enthusiastic. It's one of those things that you think would be not very useful, but it turns out to be quite useful. Um, so the Drake equation is um, such an example of such an approximation to calculate the number of civilizations in the galaxy with whom we might be able to communicate. Now. If I asked you that, I said over a cup of tea, I said, do you know how many, <clears throat> how many civilizations in the Milky Way could potentially communicate with us? You probably wouldn't have an immediate answer. Maybe you would. I'd be very impressed. But how do you break that down? Same way. You say, oh, well, actually, how many stars are forming? How fast are stars forming? How many have planets? How many of those planets can support life? How many of those planets supporting life actually develop life? Well, actually, each of these questions are things that, okay, maybe, it's an, maybe you need to talk to um, somebody in astronomy or somebody in um, uh, biology. Fraction of planets with life that could go on to develop intelligent life. Fraction of civilizations that develop a technology um, that we could detect. And each of these things are actually reasonably sensible questions. And finally, how long do those uh, civilizations survive? <laughs> Slightly fatalistic question. But <clears throat> we multiply these together, then logically we should get this estimate. And in fact, we can even use that backwards and say, if we haven't seen any, <laughs> and this number is bigger than, you know, is, several, is bigger than zero by order, of, you know, bigger than an order of magnitude, then maybe we've got one of these numbers wrong. And these are all numbers that we should be able to adequately guess. So, quite a powerful tool. Um, why is that relevant? Because when we're doing uh, modeling in industry, we need to be able to validate some of these um, assertions against um, our actual. Um, Fermi approximations. For example, we have a bridge. How can we estimate um, when we are getting sensor data, doing analysis of sensor data, using the sensor data to calibrate our finite element model? How can we actually tell whether or not um, this is giving us sensible answers? And Fermi approximation is, should always check your answers at least one different way if it has a physical interpretation um, in that approach. Okay, those are the bigger ones. The rest are equally important, but hopefully a little bit more succinct. <clears throat> so, one here, number three, be familiar with open source. Does anybody have a GitHub um, login? Got a few. Okay, oh, good, 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 about half, okay. So, what you'll find is that um, the vast majority, particularly of software and um, purely computational technologies, there is an early or leading version that is open source. That means, um, for those of you who are less familiar, that you can uh, download it, build upon it, examine it, explore it without um, having to have a commercial license. Or even more importantly, as someone in industry, when we go and talk to, say, for example, we have a software supplier and we say to them, oh, we don't think this computational model applies to our circumstances, then <clears throat> um, we are in a position, if it's open source, to actually go and assess that using our own expertise, looking at the algorithm and seeing how it's implemented. And particularly critically in industry, when there are bugs or issues that apply to our scenario, then it's important that we can fix them because our clients aren't going to accept us saying, oh, our software vendor doesn't uh, want to produce a fix just yet. I know your project's due in a month and you've got space agency funding and it's going to run out, you know. So we need to have, <clears throat> so being aware of open source is, is very important. Um, there are examples, PyTorch, TensorFlow and AI, machine learning. Um, in IoT, uh, we work quite a bit with ThingsBoard, but a lot of um, kits that we would work with 
our open source blockchain is most blockchains are open source and um, even uh, VR spaces and this is some of the work that we've done here with uh, LiDAR data and open source virtual reality rooms. Um, this one was somebody else's um, example but also a nice one from the heritage space where we also work um, and how we can develop rooms that we can walk around and explore. These things can be done in open source as well, like here. And putting these together is what gives us the tools that we can then continue to work with our own customers and clients. So <clears throat> number four, this follows on. What use is open source if you can't read the code? You should be able, and this is a key skill if you're looking at jobs and or even collaborations with industry, you should be able to read and write PhD and master's skills. And the key word here is clean code. Not all of your code is necessarily going to or needs to be clean. A lot of research work is done, you try something and then you throw it away, you try it again. But you rely on um, mathematical models being translated into um, computational implementations cleanly in a way that people can sustain, they can find bugs. Has anyone uh, had to try and find an off by one error in a large matrix computation? Maybe, anybody? Or had to try and um, work out why all of their maths seems right for three pages but the number at the end is wrong? I think a few of us have been there, right? <laughs> and those, are, those problems turn up everywhere. Um, within industry, there are very well-established accepted standards for doing mathematics on a computer um, in a way that it is easy to find those issues, resolve those issues. So learn a little bit about coding. It is important. Um, <clears throat> I'll give a brief example as well here of why whatever area you happen to work in, okay, your code will need to be read by somebody else. And <clears throat> um, for example, we might have a, this is just a toy model here, but uh, what happens is we may have to write code that will do a simulation and over time steps, it's going to have to pass data to a, another system somewhere in the cloud that's going to store the results and then somebody, a user or an educational person or a trainer is going to have to come and view those in a simple web interface and that simple web interface needs to be able to interpret the results. So, let's drop that there. there we go. Nope, not quick enough. Okay. So, <clears throat> in this particular example, we have um, our models are coded mostly but not exclusively in Python. They are run on demand. They export a certain format, um, a time series slices showing the risk around a specific area, which means at a specific time. And so we get through this time stepping method. The computational method itself is not so exciting in this case. Um, this method will produce periodic time steps. And <clears throat> that um, then comes out as a big series of results, essentially um, a large um, tensor. And that then needs to be somehow transmitted to the front end. Then when it gets there, somebody has to display this in a web browser. That person needs to understand how that is, how the format of that, the structure of that, and so you need to have clean code that is producing that, well-documented interfaces. These are the things that actually, it's the housework in industry that is really quite important. Because then our JavaScript front-end developer who can do these nice visualizations can sit down, and, it, and in this case, the data is coming through. So here, um, We'll see as we go through time, 
you can pick anywhere in this timeline. There may or may not be a time slice there, but the, the browser is going to have to render it. I'll come back to that in a second. <clears throat> So number five is understand the technology. When you're going into industry and working with uh, mathematical models, I'm going to give some examples of where that might be. Um, <clears throat> whatever you're doing, you will have constraints that come from the technology you're using. Those constraints might be as simple as it doesn't run on Windows to things that are as complex as the throughput of an infinity band um, system is going to be limiting when you're trying to parallelize a system over a large set of um, cores. Now, <clears throat> I'm imagining that some of you may or may not be familiar with any of those terms, but the key point of this is that when you are working um, <clears throat> on a system, the system is part of your decision-making process. If I have, if I know that I want to have a natural language model which uses mathematical techniques and has math, fundamentally, we are working with um, cosine distances applied to vectors. If I want to do that on a handheld device, there is a certain amount of memory I have available and there are certain algorithms that will suit that. If I know that I can process the entire corpus of, um, I was going to say Wikipedia, but that's relatively small these days, isn't it? Uh, by computational standards, but if I'm going to process the whole uh, corpus of some set of texts, historical texts, then I might have um, HPC, high performance computing facilities available, and actually there's a different set of algorithms that will give me much more accurate data uh, results with more power. So these things are all important. and. Um, being familiar with the terms is good. Kubernetes is a popular one now within uh, industry and infrastructure. Uh, increasingly, data science particularly is being done using Kubernetes. What is Kubernetes? Who's heard of, who's heard of Google? Just checking you're all still awake. Oh, we've got about half. Let's try that again. Who's heard of Google? So if you're okay, we're <laughs> about half of people, okay. Um, and, Google, where does Google run? Where do its servers run? In the clouds. So there's a famous saying that the cloud is other people's servers. <laughs> so Google, Amazon, Microsoft, um, all uh, IBM, many others all have their um, sets of servers you can run your computations on. They now often have tensor processing units or GPUs attached to them, which again, if you know those are there, there are algorithms that are more appropriate. For example, if I know that I have a GPU available, then if I have an embarrassingly parallel problem, that's actually something um, that it is worth me doing um, a certain amount of work to get it running on a GPU. If I have a problem that is hard to parallelize or is tightly um, coupled uh, with itself, then I may not benefit from that GPU or an algorithm that is such. So <clears throat> Kubernetes is a system that um, you can run your computations on top of. Um, it's useful to be familiar, at least with the terms. We also work a lot with Jupyter Notebooks. Anyone used a Jupyter Notebook? Good, okay, good. Even more people than knew about Google. That's excellent. <laughs> and uh, Jupyter Notebooks, we run those on Kubernetes. And, um, but have you thought, how do things get from my notebook into, let's say, some big web service online that I have to be able to uh, click a button and it gives me an answer when I'm doing my, uh, my online shopping. It recommends that I, I liked uh, this shirt, but it thinks I might also like these five shirts, which is great because I'm very indecisive about shirts. Well, somebody uh, may well have started out in a notebook, but that has to, that logic, that algorithm has to ultimately get online. 
And that process um, is, <clears throat> amongst other things, involves the discipline of data engineering. And um, data engineering is much more around the infrastructure side. How do we use tools like Docker? Um, how do we take what data scientists or mathematicians are working on and make it run on demand rapidly for high volumes of data? But even as a scientist, because of the reasons I mentioned, what kind of hardware will impact the algorithm? What kind of um, environment, if I'm running it on a Raspberry Pi, if I'm running it on an Android device, if I know I have five years and the state of the art is going like this, I might be able to anticipate um, new things. An extreme example of that is quantum algorithms. So I'll give one more example from this. OK. Does anyone want to try and say where you think maths might turn up? You've seen that we have some physical problem here. We do a simulation of some physics. And um, the um, results are sent through, and they're displayed on the front end. Anyone got any suggestions of what, where it's helpful to have a mathematician or a computational modeler? involved. Let's say, who thinks that there's some maths involved at, in the computational model? You, you can raise a hand or nod or OK. <laughs> Look ambiguous. OK. So, when we're, compute, when we're doing the physics, do we use maths? <laughs> yes, there we go, thanks. Um, that's reassuring. And what kind of maths, incidentally? Anyone? Linear algebra is a good example. We discretize a problem. We suddenly got a matrix problem. What do computers do? They do algebra. OK, so linear algebra is very popular, important down here. What about the server? The server is taking the output of this and it's going to have to do something. It needs maths too, because it's the one that's responsible for taking um, all of the data sets, working out from where someone's looking at, what combination of parameters, um, what space, what time box. It has to slice that data up so that it's not sending terabytes of data to this one little problem. It needs to find, here is the data, I send it to the model, I send the parameters, I validate things, and the model can go on safe, safely and do its own mathematics, mathematical um, analysis on it, numerical analysis on it, and send it back. The front end in the browser, surely that doesn't use mathematics. Well, it does, because this um, here is, in fact, in fact, you'll see it slightly more clear, clearly in this example, it's using the... Oh, using the CONREC algorithm <clears throat> to take a grid. So we have to send this data efficiently. It has to go over a wire. So we can send a time slice at, say, time 0 and time 100. But if I'm a user, I want to scroll back and forward. So this is a slightly old interface from some years ago, but shows the same point. If I slide this slider back and forward, then I should see um, a smooth transition. And under behind this, I also have grids showing uh, risk from 0 to 1. And I need to turn that into something like isoclines. Like on a mountaineering map we have, or if you imagine uh, that this risk in this area has a z-axis, we want to take um, the horizontal, we want to take the shape that forms when we intersect it with a plane at 70% risk or 60% risk. And <clears throat> and that's from a front-end perspective. We won't, don't want to send too much data. So if we send a few time slices, then we can use linear interpolation on that grid data on the front-end to be able to get at any time in between an estimate. So we've sent time 0, time 100, and suddenly we have all of an approximation for all the time slices in between. And 
we also want the smooth curve, and that's the bit where we have to think quite carefully about how can we very fast in a web browser apply an algorithm that will extract um, a solution of uh, basically uh, the grid value equals zero. And <clears throat> an example of this is the Conrec algorithm, which discretizes and then uses quite a nice technique to try and draw a boundary. And even worse than this, now imagine that your wrist has a shape like this. If I take a line through it, I've now got nested topological <laughs> structures. And then I have to think, how does my algorithm apply to an annulus or a ring? How does it apply if I've got a ring inside the ring? How do I make sure that when I start drawing these, they don't end up doing double instead of half? All mathematics. Another example is um, genetics for proteins. So we worked with genetic algorithms, which are for protein development with one of our clients. <clears throat> PyGAD, take a look if you're interested. And here we actually had to produce a library. So uh, Kanika was working uh, on this to not just establish a method that worked for um, the particular protein generation algorithm that we were looking at, but also we had to tidy it up, make it good code, make it fit the technology it was going to run, and then supply it. Those are the industrial requirements. And that's what our clients got. Another example, matrix factorization. Here we had, um, this was for a recommendation engine, which is essentially using, is a machine learning algorithm um, where we use matrix factorization methods. Um, and uh, the particular one we worked with was LightFM. Have a look, it's open source. We adapted it for our particular needs, which were, we have a small number of people who are using this app. They need recommendations and we have no prior data. It's what's called the cold start problem. So we adapted the algorithm um, and implemented it and were able to run it um, with um, our adjusted recommendation engine. I can answer questions on that after. But again, the actual adjustments required a bunch of matrix math in LaTeX, which is the most fun place to do matrix mathematics. And lastly, since we're coming up to time, Parameterization. So, <clears throat> if, I'm, if I am working on a mathematical model, I've given you some examples of what mathematicians might do um, in web settings um, or even in um, physics settings or engineering settings. But in all of these cases, you're not getting an email from somebody saying, hey, I've got a question about what happens if you set the parameter to five. Could you please rerun this for me? Because there isn't a button for that on the web browser. So when you want to make your, um, the mathematics that you do has to be able to work with a given range of parameters. You need to understand where it's valid. You need to understand when it's consistent. In other words, let's say you're working on a finite element solver. If it gets certain input data, then it will give wrong answers. So being able to understand that is important because the people who want the answers may well be engineers in industry who can't actually um, read the research paper around it. So you need to be able to parameterize and sensibly, um, and I'll go through that one, but you need to be able to adjust <clears throat> the uh, algorithm so that it can work on demand for somebody else. And that lit requires a level of robustness. That's something, again, it's a mathematician working in industry. Robustness and um, error and parameterization are all important things to understand if you're working on a model. Okay, lastly, how can you actually take this knowledge to get jobs in industry, to work, do collaborations with industry? Well, you need initiative. That's critical. You need to go out there and look at things like, some people said they had a GitHub profile. We as a company, and I know many others do, one of our first things that we uh, ask is, have you got any open source code that you've written? That gives us an idea of whether you can put maths into uh, programming. Because in most industrial applications, that's going to be an element. Um, 
the easiest way to demonstrate that is with um, a GitHub or GitLab profile, for example. That's somewhere you can um, put code that you've created. Always make sure, caveat, any code that you share is allowed to be shared. So if you're working on a project, check with the PI, check with whoever. Um, but uh, you can, of course, do things like online courses that look at, indus at the industrial application side. So you're working in industrial you know, um, mathematics for industry. Doesn't mean that you can't look at things like how does Kubernetes work? And when you talk about that, for example, in an interview or in a collaboration meeting, um, and you can also validate what other people are saying to you, then you're in a far better position. And <clears throat> finally, uh, looking, or second last, looking for uh, challenges. Kaggle, for those who haven't come across it, if you're interested in data science, some of the things that I've mentioned around uh, recommendation engines or in analyzing large amounts of data, then um, there are platforms where you can learn hackathons, where you can explore some of those techniques. So, uh, I'll come back to that. So what kind of skills do we have in-house? Well, we work with computational physics. We work with historical data, data science, web, UX and product. That's a big range. Uh, UX and product, for those who don't know, is actually talking to the real world people and understanding those conceptual models. And all of those work together, even in a smaller company. So hopefully that's given you an idea of some of the things that you should look at. Some of the ways you can use this, I think I've touched on them, but to summarize, engineering applications that require computational physics needs mathematicians. Visualization problems that you're rendering or calculating in um, browsers or 3D. If you're working on um, analysis of geospatial data, of three-dimensional point clouds, of LIDAR data, there, there's a need for industrial math for mathematicians who can actually apply algorithms that computer scientists may be less familiar with. And <clears throat> of course, um, working with data, whether that's small amounts of data or large amounts of data, understanding where you can apply algorithms, where you can use tools like PyTorch appropriately and how to do that. We're doing that and we're working with industries, everything from uh, semiconductor industry through to heritage. And, you, and another example we were talking about this morning is even in the heritage industry, there are mathematicians working on ways of doing agent-based modeling to explore how um, ancient civilizations would have spread or cultivated or um, created um, uh, habitations. So with that, I'll be around for a while if people have questions. I um, appreciate it's just gone four o'clock, so apologies for uh, holding any of you. Um, but thank you very much, and again, thank you very much for the invitation.